Thanks, everybody. You know, I am uh, slightly intimidated uh, here, not by you, Congressman, but by a, a journalistic icon from Southern California. Warren Olney is in the room. You know, many of you know Warren from uh, To The Point. Hello, Warren. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask, I'm going to open with a Warren Olney To The Point question, Congressman Liu. He'll, I, I can't quite do the voice. Congressman Liu, uh, so, so if you were to describe what Donald Trump has gotten right, what would that be? I, <laughs> Thank you, Steve, for that question. Uh, let me first say I was in Washington, D.C. last week, so I want to let you know what a joy it is to be in front of normal, rational, kind people. So, <laughs> um, so I'll tell you a secret. Uh, I didn't set out to resist this president. Uh, after November's 2016 elections, I issued a public statement uh, that went something like this. Uh, America is an exceptional country, one of the greatest in the world. One of the great things about America is our peaceful transfer of power. Donald Trump won the Electoral College. We should give him a chance to govern. About two months later, I concluded I was wrong. And it wasn't because we disagreed on policy issues. It's because he was attacking the institutions of our democracy, the First Amendment and the free press. He was attacking the legitimacy of judiciary. He was stifling internal dissent. And then he was lying at a rate I've never seen a human being lie. So that's why I started to resist him. It doesn't mean that he doesn't get some things right. So there are certain policies I support. So recently he signed the right to try legislation, which mm. gives gravely ill patients the ability to try experimental drugs. I supported that. Uh, not a lot of Democrats supported that bill, but I thought it was the right thing to do because the current status quo was not working. I think Donald Trump was right on the TPP. I thought that was a really bad deal. So he gets some things right, and when, when he says it, I, I support him, just the press never covers it. So, so you're with him with TPP, right to try. Do you support the trade sanctions he's uh, uh, just issued today on, on, on aluminum and, and Europe and a lot of allies? Uh... I could if I thought there was an overall strategy to it. I don't really see a really large strategy to it. What I see is him saying he wants to do something, then he pulls back, then he sometimes does it, sometimes he doesn't. If I was clear, it was clear to me that there was this grand strategy. I could support it. Let me ask you, you know, when, I, when we look at, uh, in the media, we look a lot at Donald Trump's favorability ratings, right? So around 30 to 40 percent, a little bit above 40 percent right now. If you look at your colleagues and, and, and your favorability ratings in Congress, they're substantially lower. And so part of our job today is to talk about this subject of can Washington be fixed? And, and I'm sort of interested, can Congress be fixed? I mean, you're part of this institution, and, and, and government isn't just tweeting you know, uh, vigorously back and forth, although I really admire your tweets. They're, they're fascinating and fun to read. Uh, but but um, what do you think, from your perspective, is missing today that, that we had at some other time in terms of how Washington worked? Uh, the framers of the Constitution did a very good job to diffuse power uh, in America. So there's three branches. I think the judiciary has, by and large, been pretty good in upholding the Constitution. I think Congress has largely fallen down in its duty to be a check and balance on the executive branch. And so you have a number of committees. I sit on the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, we have done nothing uh, on any of these important issues uh, regarding the Department of Justice, the FBI, uh, obstruction of justice, even immigration. And so um, I'm very disappointed with the Republican House. This November, all the voters get to vote again, and, and it's an inflection point in American history, and we'll see what the voters decide to do. Were you happier with your colleagues in the House when President Obama was president? I mean, were they behaving better? Was there a substantially different climate in terms of the success of working across the lines? Well, the Republicans in the House were definitely much more uh, of a check and balance on the executive branch. In fact, that's all they sort of wanted to do during Obama's years in office. So you see an exact reversal now, where there are legitimate issues where the Republican majority will simply not investigate or do a sham investigation or simply ignore the issue. What, what, when, you know, you can, what if Donald Trump were a Democrat? Would you be taking the same positions? I would. I, I, I hope I would. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think part of the question is, right, Donald Trump is elected as a Republican. We, you know, I think it's, 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 it, we're not sure whether, you know, where he falls on the political dial, but nonetheless, he's the, he's the leader of the Republican Party. He's a Republican president. And so part of the criticism is that other Republicans aren't challenging them. And I guess my question to you is, would Democrats challenge a leader like this if there were similar circumstances? 
I would hope so. And I do. But what do you really feel? I think there would be more Democrats that would challenge a Democratic president. Uh, now, by the way, we are seeing uh, some spurts of Republican courage. Uh, they just all happen to be members who are retiring. But we do see that. Mm. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've been interested in is, is the kind of diminishing culture within the Congress of uh, both sides getting together. You know, we used to hear stories about uh, you know, Animal House and you'd have Republicans and Democrats kind of uh, sharing an apartment or working out at the gym or going on coattails. Is that stuff fluff or does it, is, is in fact the, the fundraising pressure you're under and the absence of time together diminishing the ability to work with your colleagues? That's a great question. So I'm going to answer it on some different levels. Uh, there's two things going on in, in D.C. Uh, before I went to Congress, I thought, oh, there's just a lot of fighting. It's true, there's a lot of fighting. Uh, but there's also a lot of things being done uh, that you don't see covered, that Atlantic doesn't cover, uh, or, or TV. For the same reason, you don't cover planes that land, mm. right? It's not interesting. People uh, don't buy newspapers. They don't watch television. You haven't it's, seen our plane right? landing channel? <laughs> So what ends up happening is there's all these bills being passed on a bipartisan basis. I routinely work with Republicans on a number of different issues. I've had nearly 10 uh, pieces of legislation I wrote be enacted into law. And you don't do that if you don't work with Republicans. But it doesn't get covered because it's, it's not interesting in the way that conflict is interesting. So I think we get a skewed view mm -hmm. of what's, what's happening. Uh, and also, it's very interesting when you sort of interact with colleagues in Congress we treat each other with respect as members of Congress. Um, I think we treat constituents with respect. But then people go on TV, and you see a very sort of different, different tone. So I think a lot of it has to do with the setting in which you see these members of Congress. I guess one of the things I am interested in is how, how people like yourself think about, reach out to, and talk uh, to those that, some of whom Amy Chua was just talking about, you know, the 35 percent that are, I know you were raised in Ohio, uh, my family's from Oklahoma. Anybody from Oklahoma in the audience? Yeah, yeah we've got an Oklahoma in here. Where, where in Oklahoma? Uh, Oklahoma City. So I'm Bartlesville. Uh, and, and it's a different world there. If you're out in, you know, the Midwest United States and you're uh, in a very different environment where many families do not have people that went off to college, most of them are military families that have served the military. Many of them have gone out to, you know, work in uh, uh, positions, uh, many of them in tech, and then saw their jobs transferred to India or the Philippines right. or China. And so they felt that the social contract between them serving their country and then coming home, the quid pro quo between serving the nation and, and, and kind of an economic return came undone. And, and I'm just interested in, in whether or not you and your colleagues think about that. Because I want to channel that for a minute, because I think that's part of what we're missing in our conversation is that's not an illegitimate uh, frustration that these people have. You're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, so consider how Bernie Sanders who's not a Democrat, almost won the Democratic nomination. I believe he tapped into a very similar anger that Donald Trump tapped into. And I was actually talking about this when I was in a California state legislature. I, I was saying there's two economies going on. There's an economy where you've got a degree from UCLA or you have a graduate degree, you're doing pretty well. Uh, and in certain fields like healthcare, biotech, high tech, aerospace, entertainment, and so on, you're probably getting the fruits of this economy. But if you just have a high school degree, the last two decades have been a disaster for you. And, and you're angry, and, you, and your children's future looks less bright, and you don't know what to do. And Bernie Sanders came in and said, it is the fault of Wall Street and billionaires. He almost won with that argument, uh, the Democratic primary. Donald Trump came in and said, no, it's the fault of people that look like me, and, and immigrants and minorities. But they're tapping a very similar anger, and they just start directing it at, at other people. But there are a lot of people who are hurting in America, and, and they, they see a system that is not working for them. And so I've been a huge champion of, of workforce investment. Uh, by the way, coal is not coming back, just, just so you all know that. <laughs> so to me, the best way we honor these families, uh, some of them who have suffered horrific health effects because of coal, is we should invest in the communities, we should get the children um, ability to move out or, or stay there, but do some other kind of industry and get the people retrained to do uh, a sustainable job for the 21st century. 
instead of lying to them, which is what the president is saying by saying coal is coming back. It, it's just not coming back. But there are people that are hurting. We, we have to acknowledge that and try to help them the best that we can. You know, Ted, when I, I told you out there in the green room that, that when I began reading the material that my staff had put together on your past, they said, uh, Ted Lewis become this Twitter superstar. He has, he's, you know, his, his followers have surged to 120,000, <laughs> which uh, uh, it, it, it is nothing like the 698,000 you really have. But I mean, I guess as you become this sort of Twitter star, you become the muscle of the Democratic Party to a certain degree in, ba in trolling Trump, uh, uh, I, I think is going on. Do you think, you know, Michelle Obama talked about, you know, the Democrat, you know, the Republicans take the, the, the low road, we're still going to take the high road. Do you think the tone that you sometimes have in that or that others in, in responding to, if that's the right tone we should right. be taking, that you should be taking? Last year, my uh, mom called me and she said... Did she read your Twitter? Oh, she said, are you sure it's okay to say these things? Um, <laughs> and, and she was actually more along the lines of, she was actually sort of fearful for my safety. And I said, no, I, I believe in American democracy and I trust um, our government and the people. Uh, but one of the great things about America is I get to say these things. Uh, imagine if you know, I was in China and I said these things about the leader of China. I, I'd be in jail right now, right? Or, or Russia and I said these things about Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, but the tack I've tried to take, uh, first of all, by the way, it, just, it's all based on anger, right? Uh, but no one wants to read an angry person, so I'll count to 20, because I'll read some ridiculous thing that just happened mm. out of the White House. I'll calm down, I'll count to 20, and I'll say, okay, how can I write this in a way that doesn't come off sounding like an angry person, which is my advice to the president, he should count to 20 before he tweets something. But I've taken to sort of using uh, satire, mm. and my view is humor and satire can re reveal truth in a way that other forms sometimes cannot. One of my favorite literary works is Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. And as you may remember, it was uh, an essay he wrote about how you cook and eat children uh, to demonstrate the plight of the poor. And it was actually quite effective at the time. And so that's sort of the tone I've taken. Instead of sort of trying to be angry, I try to sort of point out the absurdity of what just happened uh, so people can, can look at it in, in a different way. You know, one of the things I wanted to get from you, we have a lot of people in the audience that are concerned about the state of affairs in American civil society. And I think one of the most moving things I've seen in Washington recently was the march uh, with the yeah. students who march against guns and, and march for life, uh, the Parkland students and how they've organized. And when I step back and look at it as the Nixonian realist I am, I have to say that you know, really brilliant movement, but I haven't seen Congress do anything. I haven't seen any net positive change in the environment yet. Am, am I too cynical? Do you see something coming on? And what, you know, given that you're an insider now, what, inst what, what advice do you have to people out there that want to actually get to uh, yeah. a better place on some of these tough issues? Uh, so my view of politics is that everything seems impossible until it happens. So if I were to tell you let's say we're back 10 years, and I said, okay, in 10 years, we're gonna have gay marriage in 50 states, and a bunch of them are gonna be smoking weed. <laughs> you think I was you know, crazy? That's happening right now. Um, so what you saw with the Parkland students, we actually did make some changes. As you remember, uh, the state of Florida, not a radical blue state, actually did increase the age uh, to buy firearms. And then Congress did make a change. So for a long time, the CDC could not even do research on guns and how it affects health and safety. We changed that. Now, it wasn't widely reported, because again, it's not that interesting. It doesn't sell a lot of newspapers. But that was a change that the NRA had opposed for a very long time. So you are seeing some, some movement, I think, to get some of the bigger changes in gun safety laws, you would need to change the makeup of Congress. And ultimately, it comes down to you. It comes down to the American people. I think Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said that public sentiment is everything. Uh, with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. So you've seen a number of people resign uh, from high profile positions in the Trump administration, not because there was any power forcing them to, it was because of public sentiment. Uh, you've seen some of the worst policies not get enacted because of public sentiment. Ask yourself, why, why is there not this stupid wall still, even though that was one of the main things the president talked about? Public sentiment. I mean, you've got members of Congress reacting to that, saying, 
this is a pretty stupid idea, we're just not gonna fund it. I wanna to go to all of you in, in just a second, so if you have questions, put up, and somebody who's gonna uh, run to you with a microphone. Just, you've, you've also see, um, you've talked a bit about impeachment and the prospects for impeachment in the past. You know, in the Atlantic, we, we ran a piece recently, said impeachment's the wrong course, the wrong way to go. How do you feel about uh, the likelihood of impeachment should uh, the House be taken over by the Democrats? My view of impeachment is that uh, it's like the power to declare war. It's one of the gravest responsibilities that Congress has. It should never be our first option. It always has to be our last option. I think it's gonna depend on what the Mueller investigation uh, reveals at its full conclusion. My personal view of what has already happened is it's pretty clear to me the President of the United States has obstructed justice. Uh, at least once, and, and probably more than once. Impeachment is also a political issue. So I don't think at this point in time, the American people would be willing to impeach a president just because he obstructed justice, even though I think that is a legitimate basis. I think you probably need something else. I think you would need some sort of conspiracy or complicity. Um, so we'll see if, if, if that existed. So that's my view of where we are. And you, you would support it? If, if I thought there was a... a something beyond? Does there's, obstruction there's something, get you yeah. there, or do you need obstruction plus X? Well, so it's interesting, as you know, uh, in Watergate, the first article of impeachment against Richard Nixon that passed out of the House Judiciary Committee was obstruction of justice. But there was also something else going on, right? Uh, there was, in fact, this whole slush fund. They were paying people off. Uh, there were the, the Nixon tapes. So I, I think um, it is possible the American people at some point will get to a point where they think obstruction of justice by itself is, is enough for impeachment. I don't think the American people uh, is there yet. Is that where Ted Lieu is? Yeah. Oh, as a legal matter, I think it's yeah. a legitimate basis for impeachment, Ab absolutely. Hard to nail him down. Uh, uh, let me open up the yeah. floor here. Warren, do you have a question? Sure. There you go. I love the <laughs> voice. Hi, uh, Warren Olney with KCRW Radio. Uh, Congressman, you're working with Republicans, you said, and we don't hear very much about that, but it's going on. Given the president's approval rating or disapproval rating in so many places, are there Republicans who support him publicly, but who seem to be worried privately about what that might mean ultimately for their uh, futures. Great question. That is. Uh, so I recommend all of you uh, read this article written by Eric Erickson. He's a conservative blogger. I don't agree with him uh, very much, but he wrote this amazing piece where he recounts his conversation with a Republican member of Congress at a Safeway grocery store. So this Republican member goes on Fox, defends the president. And then at this conversation, he just unloads on the President of the United States. He says words and phrases about the President that I would, would never say. And I remember thinking afterwards, I was both hopeful and I was sad. I was sad because I thought, this is amazing hypocrisy. I was hopeful because I now understood, yes, there, was one, there is one reality. I was starting to doubt that a little mm. bit. I was wondering if Republicans and Democrats look the same thing and have different views. And it was clear to me that, no, there is one reality. It's just that some of my colleagues across the aisle choose to lie about it. But it was very clear that most of my colleagues across the aisle understand it is messed up, what we're seeing in the President of the United States. And just a simple thing of trying to unite the country, that is not what this president is doing. And no matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you will come to that conclusion, just the way he responds. You could look at his rallies he does. Um, they are not rallies meant to unite people. They're meant to energize a certain portion of his base. Um, the things he says on Twitter, they're not meant to unite the American people. And so I think that's, that's very troubling from the leader of our country. Thank you, yes, right here. Um, good morning, thanks for coming out. I'm a student here and I'm curious, how do you remain critical of Trump but also balance not dividing people more and not alienating the right and creating like bigger political divides? So, so I'll, I'll answer some different ways. Um, when I vote, I vote based on the merits of the legislation. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter to me if it's supported by Trump or Republican or a Democratic colleague. 
if it's a bad idea, I'm going to vote against it. If it's a good idea, I'll, I'll vote for it. So this right to try legislation, I, I voted for it because I thought the status quo is, is unacceptable. Even though that was one of the main priorities of Vice President Pence, Donald Trump, and, and a lot of Republicans. Um, my view is if the White House does eight things crazy or 800, I'm going to point every one of them out. I think we cannot normalize what should not be normalized. So that's one thing I try to do, uh, is to just point out uh, when the administration violates norms or violates laws or has policies or, in, or indefensible. By the way, separating children from the parents at the border mm -hmm. right, is so cruel and inhumane that even the president will not accept responsibility for it. Right? He bizarrely sort of blames Democrats uh, for his own administration's policy. One of the things Congress gets to do is we get to hold hearings. So hopefully on the Judiciary Committee, we have oversight over immigration, we can have a hearing uh, on this issue. Um, so I just try to do what I think is the right thing to do and just let the chips fall where they fall. Let me just read and share one of your um, uh, recent tweets. I love your tweets, uh, even if I don't agree with them all. I'm an independent, but, uh, but they're great. There should be a kind of you know, Ted Lieu greatest hits uh, uh, on Twitter. But you say, dear real, dear real Donald Trump, in, colon, in case you forgot, here are the leaders of the Russia probe. Republican Ray, appointed by you. Republican Rosenstein, appointed by you. Republican Mueller, appointed by Rosenstein, who was appointed by you. And DNI Coates, Dan Coates, who's a Republican, appointed by you. It's, it's just, so you're, you're out there with zingers. And so I'm interested, just as we close up, uh, the president has just announced he's going to pardon Dinesh D'Souza. Many of you may know Dinesh, who's in, in this area. Um, uh, violated uh, campaign finance laws, committed fraud in that area, accused of that, uh, and found guilty of that. Uh, what is your tweet on Dinesh D'Souza right. going to be? Yeah. Yeah. Make it so, up here. Show us your method. Right. <laughs> so I haven't actually tweeted on Dinesh D'Souza because I generally like to get f more facts. I just need right. to know exactly what he did, what he was convicted of. Mm. But the overall message, though, I think we should think about is the power to pardon, right, is a pretty amazing power, but it's also centered on the view that in a society we do want to give mercy uh, to certain individuals who may have been unfairly treated. And to me, the best way to do that is we should have a process for determining to whom should we show mercy. And I think it says a lot about society. What troubles me as a president is just sort of violating and not following the, the huge part in process the Department of Justice has set up that other presidents have routinely followed. And that what is, is what is troubling to me. That's sort of done on ad hoc basis, seems to be done to gen up his base. And to me, that's very troubling. It should really be centered on you know, mercy and how do we want to uh, implement mercy in our society. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Ted Lieu. Thank you.